Hey guys, today we're going to be building a simple toy box. Got a couple hand holes in the sides, nice hinge lid. We're building this out of some three quarter inch maple plywood. Stay tuned, hit the subscribe button. Let's get to it. And so we begin. You could actually use any type of plywood that you would like for this toy box build. I just happen to have some maple plywood in the garage already. It's nice and smooth, takes paint well, it's good and sturdy. So that's what we went with. This is going to be a pretty simple build. We're not going to use a whole lot of tools in this build. One thing you'll see me use a lot is the AccuCut for breaking down sheets of plywood. Right here I'm just checking underneath to make sure that my blade is just sticking through as I cut. If you don't have some type of track or track saw, it's not a big deal. Go down and get you a one by that's straight. If the store that you are getting your wood from happens to have a 48 inch level go ahead and grab that and take that over to the wood aisle for a minute check out those one buys find you one that's good and straight along the edge you can clamp that to your sheets of plywood to use as a guide <clears throat> you just want to make sure to measure on your circular saw on the bottom plate you want to measure from the edge that you're going to run along the guide to the edge of the saw blade make sure you remember which side of the saw blade you measure to because that's going to throw your cut off a little bit if you don't the thickness of the saw blade and then wherever you're wanting to actually cut the piece you're going to add that distance that you measured on the bottom of that circular saw Move your piece of one by over to those marks, clamp it down, and then just run your saw along and make your cut. I just happened to buy one of these AccuCuts, and honestly, it's been really good. I haven't had any issues with it. Set it up properly, and I have broke down tons of sheets of plywood with it. With no problem at all it does stay in place really well if you do happen to have one and have problems with it sliding around clean those rubber rails off on the bottom and it will stick to the wood a lot better and stay in place also try to wipe off your plywood or blow off your plywood in between cuts that kind of keeps it from Move it around and get all that excess sawdust off of there. You notice I have a quarter inch sheet of scrap wood down there on the end of the workbench. The reason for that is that since my blade is only sticking through just a minimal amount, I can lay that under the portion that I'm going to cut run my saw across it and not destroy my workbench. Although my workbench is not in the greatest shape currently. I do plan on building another one because I kind of use it as an outfeed table for my table saw and I just ordered a new table saw. Still waiting to see when that's going to be shipped and get here but I'm going to build a new workbench that matches the height of that table saw. Also going to go with a better top. Probably use some MDF nice and flat for assembling things now you can build this toy box to any dimension that you want 
This particular one is 15 and 3 quarters inches to the top. Uh, the top is 3 quarter inch. So I cut my sides 15 inches tall. They're also 15 inches from front to back. And then my front and back, which are sandwiched between the sides later, were cut to 22 inches. When I cut one of the sheets, broke it down, I cut it 15 and a half inches because our top is going to have a half inch overhang on the front. And then we will measure across the width of our toy box once we get it together and make sure we have that half inch overhang on the sides. We're doing a little pre sand in here, getting everything ready for later. Alright guys, let's talk about sanding for a minute. Uh, I like to use an orbital sander with a round disc. Um, this is a DeWalt that I have. I'm not affiliated with DeWalt in any way for this out of pocket. I uh, really enjoy this sander. I did get the variable speed version. Really helps out a lot if I'm doing some rough stock. And I've got some 80 or 100 grit on here. I can really remove a lot of material fast if I turn this thing on up to six. Uh, if I'm doing smoother stuff or finished work, once I get down, because I tend to go from 100 or 80 grit to 150 to 220, depending, unless I'm doing something that's already got a decent finish on it, I may start at 150 or just go ahead and go to 220. It's kind of do what you need for the particular project that you're doing. Now, one thing to pay attention to is don't stay in one place too long. Make sure you're continually moving. Uh, anytime you stay in one place too long, you're going to get dips and valleys, and it's not going to be good. Also, when you're working with plywood, you don't want to stay in one place too long because you'll actually wear through the veneer, uh, which isn't a big deal if you're doing a paint grade piece. You want your you're more worried about your edges and seams being smooth. Now, if it's a stain grade piece, don't burn through that veneer because uh, you won't it won't take the stain properly because obviously your plywood has glue in between all the sheets. Another thing, I am kind of lazy, so I generally do my edges with the sander. Same concept. You want to make sure that you're square to the surface and keep that sander moving don't stay in one place too long usually it's just a couple light passes i'll turn it down to three or four at times uh, when i'm doing the size makes it a little more easy to control doesn't remove as much material because all we're trying to do is give us a nice clean edge remove any loose splinters in there uh, another aspect is going to be your sandpaper itself um, Get some decent sandpaper. I have used Diablo 3M. I'm currently using Serious Grit. I can order it online, have it shipped, uh, order it in large amounts. It works very well. It's been pretty durable. Haven't had any tear outs. Uh, do, like, I've had good luck with all three sandpapers. Just I uh, ordered some of this in a large amount and it was real easy. Uh, another thing is the bag on this one actually works pretty well. I was surprised. I've had cheaper sanders. The bag didn't work very well on. Didn't collect a lot of dust. I actually have to empty this one quite often. Um, you can also remove the bag. It just twists and pops off. You can attach a hose to have continuous dust collection, which once I get dust collection set up, that's what I will be doing. Uh, all in all, I have no complaints about this sander. Uh, like I say, get you a good one. I've had cheap ones. They don't last very long. You just spend a ton of money over and over. Really not worth it. Spend a little bit of money once, and you'll have it for a long time. I've had this for several months. I haven't had any problems with it, even with me knocking it off the workbench a couple times, not paying attention. Still works like a champ. No problems at all. So would recommend that. And that's pretty much all I have on sanding. Let's get back to building. And now we're going to start to see our toy box take shape. 
I like to get a good thick bead of glue on there and brush it down. You want a good strong joint on all your corners. I don't believe I caught it on video, but once you get this clamped up, you're going to want to take your speed square if you have one or some type of square and just check and make sure that it is square on all four corners. This is going to help when we insert the bottom later. I cut the bottom to fit inside of the four sides on this one. You'll also make sure that your top has proper overhang on all sides if your box is square. You don't want it looking all crazy and misaligned. Now again, my workbench is not the most level surface to work on. So you'll see me on a lot of projects while I'm still using this workbench checking to make sure that my top edges are all aligned. If you cut all your pieces correctly then your bottom edges will be aligned as well. Also make sure that your seams are as flush as possible. Now this is a paint grade piece, so we'll be able to sand it pretty hard later uh, to make sure that all of our seams are nice and flush. If you're doing a stain grade piece, let's say make sure everything is nice and smooth as possible so your seams don't stick out. As far as a paint grade piece goes, you're going to want to really sand and get those seams all flush. Use some type of filler on any gaps because when you paint, you don't want to have any lines showing through where everything comes together. Another thing when working with plywood, uh, if you're going to be painting it, it's good to use a little primer on the edges. I like to use, I actually use a spray primer. Uh, you're gonna wanna use some kind of bonding primer. I think Rust-Oleum makes one. It works pretty well. You can get it at Walmart or any of the box stores. Uh, I kinda like it because it is also works as a filler. Get a couple good coats on there and sand it down nice and smooth before you put your coats of paint on. We want some nice smooth edges. Now here, I am just drilling some countersunk holes that I'm going to put some screws in and we're going to fill with some dowel. I'm just doing this to speed up the process. I don't have to leave it in clamps for a long time. Once we get the screws in, that'll allow the glue to dry and we can continue working on this. Just throwing some two inch screws in there that I happen to have over on the shelf. These countersink bits you can get pretty much anywhere. I think I got this one at like Home Depot or somewhere. Uh, works great, it cuts a 3 8 inch diameter countersink which is perfect for the dowel rod put a little glue on that we'll tap that in there just gonna want to tap that lightly until it bottoms out make sure it's nice and square in the hole not off to an angle clean your glue off a little bit actually just going to take you can use any kind of hand like pull saw like a flush cut saw I happen to have this multi-tool that works great for trimming these off I use it to trim these off and also trim off 
Anytime I do pocket hole screws where they're going to be on the outside, I'll put some dowel rod in there as well to fill those holes. Right here, we just measure the inside of our box. I've already cut this down to size, but you're just going to measure whatever size box you build. Just cut your bottom to fit those dimensions. I'm just going to put glue on all four sides here. I just put a couple scrap one buys up there on the workbench to set my board on to not make the glue come off down on the workbench. Came out with a nice snug perfect fit. Got to tap it in a little bit. Not too tight. You don't want to put stress on those joints that you've glued up. But it's good and snug, so when it dries, it's not going anywhere. All I'm doing here is putting some clamps underneath these uh, cheap clamps you can get from Harbor Freight they kind of have a flat edge on one side and they'll actually hold your piece up if you clamp it down it gives you room to get clamps underneath and right here my other sides are flush this one was sticking out just a touch so I just grabbed a couple clamps and you can Tighten those down real gently. You don't want to get them too tight. You just pull them down a little bit and it'll pull that edge right in there. Say less work sanding later, better fit. Everything you do now is going to have an outcome on your final product. Clean a little bit of glue off so I have a little bit less sanding later. Right here we have filled all of our dowel holes. Now on your dowel holes, it depends on how OCD you are. Since I am painting this, I didn't measure, I just drilled and Put those screws in, countersunk, and then filled the holes with a wooden dowel. And you can just take your sander and go over it and clean it up, and it'll be nice and smooth. If you were doing something like this on a stain grade piece, uh, obviously you would want to measure, kind of get everything lined up properly. That way you don't have a bunch of crazy dowels all over the place in random spots. Just take the sander and clean up those edges nice and smooth. We don't want any splinters sticking out anywhere. You gotta clean all that glue residue off. Once I finish with that initial sanding I'm just gonna come around and take the router and I'm just putting a slight chamfer on the edges you can kind of do this to whatever look you desire so I didn't go real big here with it just a, a very slight one you can do a round over bit chamfer bit this just kind of helps anytime you have sharp edges uh, it's going to get dented up, especially a toy box. It's going to get used a lot, open and closed. It's going to get banged into my stuff. So you want to 
just round those edges over a little bit. If you don't have a router, that's not a big deal either. You can take some sandpaper and do the same thing. The router's just a little quicker. And you just take some sandpaper and go along those edges and round them over. And that's enough routering. So this is something that I could have done before assembling this. I'm just going to cut a couple hand holes in the side. I'm not going to lie, I kind of forgot. So I can just come back and do it now. It's not a big deal. But I'm just going to measure over to the width that I want the hand holes and how far down I want the center of the hand hole take my center punch it's not really necessary but I have some cheap paddle bits uh, they're not the straightest I do need to order a better set so I like to center punch everything that way I make sure that my hole is exactly where I want it to be and I am just going to take a one inch paddle bit and when you're drilling with these, you're going to want to drill through till your bit just comes through the other side, the center point of the bit. And then turn around and drill it from the opposite side. If you don't, you'll end up with a bunch of tear out. If you just try to drill all the way through in one pass. And then you got to fill it and sand it and it's a lot easier if you just do it like this drill bits are something I would recommend if you can get a little bit better ones it'll save you a lot of time you'll have cleaner holes just all around better right here we're just going to mark across the bottom of our holes and across the top of our holes so that we can come back with the jigsaw and cut right across there and make our opening This would be a lot easier if you actually just set the piece down on the ground and cut it, but you know, sitting here in front of the camera, I don't really feel like moving the camera right now, so we're just going to cut it up there on the workbench. Now I'm just going over that with some hand sandpaper just to knock off any rough edges because I'm going to come back with the router. And I actually did a pretty deep round over on this. You want it nice and smooth. You don't want to catch any splinters. If you stick your hand in there, you don't want any rough edges. I'm just going to round over the outside of each hole and the inside of each hole. Actually turned out pretty nice.
now that that is done, we are going to move on to installing the top. Now, somehow my GoPro managed to lose a little bit of footage. These are those European style hidden hinges that I was talking about earlier in the video. They actually make a jig for drilling these. It has a Forstner bit. The one edge actually positions it the correct amount from the edge of your door or top that you're going to put these on. Uh, it also sets the depth. There's a stop collar. Because you only want to cut down. I want to say these are about a half inch is what the hole requires to be. So it's not the end of the world losing a little bit of that video, but if you get you one of those jigs, it makes life so much easier. I think mean, Craig makes them and also you can find them on Amazon as well. Mine is some off brand because the box stores here were all out of the jig so I just ordered one on Amazon and it honestly has worked really really well. I've drilled a bunch of holes with it. The hinges fit very nicely in there. So all I did to mount the top once I had the hinges mounted to the lid was laid that box on its side, slid the top up there, measured my overhang on each side, marked my holes on my hinges. You want to make sure that you push your hinge down and it's exactly where it's supposed to be on the inside of that lip. And then I pre-drilled with a small drill bit so we don't have any splits and then we'll stick some screws down in there if you're going to use the impact make sure that you don't over tighten them because they are very easy to strip out And as I said before, you can really use any kind of hinge that you want to use. You can use the piano style hinge. Let's say I just happen to have a bunch of these because I use them on hidden compartment shelves and things like that and cabinet doors. And I like the way they look, like the way they function. They're really adjustable. See right here, I'll take my screwdriver and kind of adjust them a little bit, tighten them up. So when we open and close the lid, it opens and closes properly. And that is pretty much it. Now we have a functioning toy box that will get painted sometime this week if you want to check that out you can go on over to the instagram at story woodworking once i get it painted i'll post some pics over there That was our build on the simple toy box. Uh, went pretty well. Everything turned out nice. If you have any questions, any comments, any ideas, anything you would like to see on the channel, anything you'd like to see me do differently in the videos, any kind of how-to videos you'd like to see on any kind of tools in the shop, uh, throw those down in the comments. And as always, uh, if you like the video, hit that like button. Appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button. And I hope you all have a good day.